Good morning. Welcome to the Orchard Online. We are so excited that you're tuning in this morning, wherever that may be from. We are excited that you're here, that we're going to worship together here in just a few minutes. Before we do that, before we uh, sing some songs, before we hear some teaching, uh, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask Him to be in this time and in our hearts. Father, this morning we offer up uh, just a short period of our day, Lord, in dedication to you in hopes that, Lord, it would impact the way that we offer up even more parts of our lives to you. So, Father, in this time, as we dedicate some time to singing your, your praises and your, uh, your faithfulness and your goodness to us, Lord, it is in the time that we open up the scriptures and seek to learn more about, about your Son and the way that he has called us to live, God, we ask that you would be in our hearts, that you would work in our hearts, that you would do a move in our hearts this morning to shape us, to move us to be more like your Son. God, that as we're, as we're learning to, to live the good life, that your Spirit would, would come beside us as guide and as counselor as we seek uh, on that endeavor. Lord, as we walk that path this morning, Lord, may you open up our eyes to new things. Lord, may you be in our hearts today. Bless our time together. In your name, amen. Why don't you worship with us?
take a hold of you and there is no shame in looking like a fool but I'll give you what I can't give to take a hold of you Good morning, church. We're so glad to have you with us today as we continue in our series, The Good Life. In a moment, you're going to be hearing from our next generation pastor, Joey Bates, who will be preaching centered around the verse, Matthew 5, 6. It says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, we thank you. God, we just thank you for the opportunity to not even be in the same room, but still be connected as a church, as your body. God, we lift up Joey this morning as, as he comes to bring us uh, a message from your word, God. We just ask that you speak through him and use the Holy Spirit to empower him uh, to, to give us more of Jesus, God. That is why we are here. We love you. We thank you. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Hunger and thirst are fascinating feelings. They're not emotions, but they definitely affect our emotions. They're almost like states of being. You either are hungry or you're not hungry. You are thirsty or you're not thirsty. But the ironic thing about hunger is that it's all-consuming. I mean, the thought of consuming something that satisfies our hunger actually begins to consume us. Now, hunger and thirst are, are, are feelings that we get when our bodies are deficient in nutrients, be it food or water. And our body shows these signs. We have a dry mouth or we have a noisy stomach. I'm sure some of you, as I'm talking about hunger and thirst, maybe taste a little bit of that dry mouth or maybe your stomach has started to growl. I know I'm certainly starting to feel it. When we, when, when we feel hungry or when we feel thirsty, we don't really feel very blessed. But what if I told you that the good life was about feeling hungry and thirsty? That the good life was about having our deepest hungers satisfied? My name is Joey Bates. I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm so glad that you're tuning in with us as we continue in our series this morning called The Good Life. We've been looking at the, the Beatitudes at the beginning of, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And the one we're looking at today is Matthew 5, 6. Uh, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And I want to tell you a story that I believe applies to this verse. And this story begins with a woman. And this woman has to hide. You know, she, she, she knows she can't be seen publicly, because if she's seen publicly, she knows that she will be shamed publicly. And, and no, she doesn't hide in darkness. She doesn't hide with a face covering. But instead, she hides the hottest and brightest part of the day. Noon. She knew nobody would be where she's going at noon. The heat was just too much in her part of the world. But as oppressive as the heat was, even more so would be the oppressiveness of the judgmental stares that she would feel if she went at any other part of the day. She knew she couldn't be seen. So she picked up her jar and she began to make the trek outside of town. I'll just get my water and I'll go home. No one will notice me. No one will care. And every footstep she took brought her closer and closer to her destination, but further and further into shame and emptiness. She was on her way to the well. And oh, this well, it meant so much to her and so much to her ancestors. 
You see, this was the well where God had reconciled Jacob and Esau many years before. But when she saw this well, reconciliation was the furthest from her mind. When she saw this well, all she was reminded about was the distance between her and her people. You see, the people of her town reminded her of her unrighteousness. They, they whispered about her. They, they, they spread rumors about her. They looked at her without any dignity or personhood. And of course, she longed for the world to be different. But that world seemed to be far on the horizon. This well and all it represented reminded her of the brokenness of her world. And as she approached it this day, her stomach dropped even more because she saw something she never wanted to see. There was a man sitting by the well. Shame began to inch into her mind. This is the very situation she was trying to avoid. Shame began to whisper, what is he doing here? No man, no one comes to the well at noon. And then she noticed something that, that made her stomach drop even more. This man was not somebody from her village. But instead, he was a Jewish man. Here in Samaria, where Jewish men would avoid at all cost. Why was he here at this place in this moment? Well, she can't turn around. She's already come too far. And she can't come back later because then it just won't be one man, but it will be a whole multitude. And the reminders of her shame and, and her emptiness will be uh, multiplied. She has to get water. She has to because she's thirsty. She'll just keep her head down. Yes, yes, that's the answer. She'll just continue to hide. No reason to interact. If she doesn't make eye contact or speak, maybe he doesn't say anything. Maybe he doesn't bring up her unrighteousness or, or, or the, the, the division between Jewish people and Samaritan people. She'll just get her water and continue about her daily routine of avoidance. Please give me something to drink. Please give me something to drink. These words split the silence with an acknowledgement of a shared experience. Thirst. The man by the well is thirsty too, and he is asking the woman for something to drink. The woman looks at him and says, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why do you ask me for something to drink? You see, friends, the oppression of shame, which is the fruit of unrighteousness, always makes us look at the differences between us. That's what the people in her village have done to her. They've pointed out the differences. They point out how she's unholy and how they're holy, how she's unrighteous and she's righteous. Or, or excuse me, how she's unrighteous and how they're righteous. This has happened so much that it's become ingrained in her mind that this is her default position as she approaches this man. She focuses on the difference between her and him and not their shared experience. The reason the man gives for his request is certainly unexpected. Into this woman's shame, he speaks something, an emotion that she hasn't felt in a long, long time. He says, if you only knew, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. I'm sure the woman tried to hide a confused look because what this man is saying doesn't make any sense. He doesn't have a rope or a bucket. He has no way to draw water out of this well. And even if he could, why would he share it with her, a Samaritan woman? Jewish people and Samaritan people don't get along, and that is an understatement. Well, she might as well respond to this man with these objections because he did speak to her. He continues, he says, Anyone who drinks from this water, the man says, gesturing to the well, will become thirsty again. 
But those who drink from the water I give them will never be thirsty again. The woman's eyes began to widen with anticipation and excitement. To never be thirsty again. To, have, to never have to bear the heat of the noonday sun. Or even worse, the, 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 the oppressiveness of the judgmental stares. She wouldn't have to live in shame or unrighteousness any longer. The man continues, it will become a fresh and bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. The woman feels something she hasn't felt in so many years. Hope. She has to have this water. This water would rid her from her life of hiding. She'd never have to walk in shame, which is the fruit of unrighteousness, ever again. Give me this water, please, she shouts not noticing that she is now repeating the man's first words back to him. I'll never be thirsty again, and I'll never have to come back to this well. She wouldn't have to live in shame, and she wouldn't have to carry the weight of people pointing out her unrighteous decisions ever again. But as quickly as hope appeared, it was crushed with the man's next words. Go get your husband. Of course. She must have thought. It was too good to be true. See, this woman, she hasn't been perfect. She, she hasn't been faithful really to God or to, to really one man. She's done what she's had to do to survive. She's compromised in order to live. But, but is that really living? How could she not have seen that there was a catch coming? Because any time the world has offered her something good, there's always a catch. Anytime the world seems to have offered her freedom, there's always something that comes with it. I can't tell him the whole truth, she says. So I'll just tell him half of it. I have no husband, she whispers back to him. The man nods and smiles. He says, you're right. You don't have a husband. The woman is surprised at how confident yet gentle this man is speaking. He doesn't even know her. How does he know about her life? He continues, he says, you have had five husbands. And the man that you're living with now, man, you're, you're not even married, to, that man you're not even married to. You've spoken the truth. The woman heard his words and then heard her heart skip a beat and heard the air leave her lungs. Her shame that she's been trying to hide has been exposed. She's been found out. The truth of her unrighteous decisions have been brought into the open. Sir, her voice quivers with respect and awe as her mind races around what's happening before her. Shame tries to creep back into her mind. Shame that reminds her of her unrighteousness. Shame that says, focus on the differences. He obviously wants to lecture her. He obviously wants to tell her that she's not righteous. She, he is no different than the world around her. Obviously, she, he wants to lecture her, she's thinking. Well, she can take it. She's taken a lot worse. She'll just listen to the lecture She'll let him yell. She'll let him argue. Then she'll get her water and she'll be on her way. She gives him an opening. You must be a prophet, she says. So, so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist on that, that Jerusalem is the only place to worship while we Samaritans claim that it's here at Mount Gerasim? Here comes the lecture, she thought. Here comes the judgment looks, the judgmental looks. Here comes this man saying that he's better than her. She should just grin and bear it. But the man's voice is peaceful. You see, this man isn't interested in giving a lecture like the Jewish Pharisees or the teachers of the religious law or the villagers. No, this man speaks like he's talking to family. Believe me, dear woman, 
The time is coming when, when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on, on a mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about Him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When, worshipers will worship, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth. This changes everything. Could this be the living water that this man is speaking of? Could, could, could the time of the Messiah, the world Savior, be coming? Is this the time He's talking about? Is it time for God to eradicate that which divides one people group from another, that which divides one person from her village? Is it time for God to begin to heal and to make the world right? Is it time for this woman to no longer live under the shame that has long oppressed her? Well, she has to ask. This man seemed to know everything about her. Maybe he knows about the Messiah's coming. She looks at him and she says, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ, and when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. The light of hope has reappeared in her heart. And as the light of hope grows in the woman's heart, that same light shines through the man's eyes as he says, I am the Messiah. The woman barely has time to process what she's heard before she finds herself running towards the villagers she's long tried to avoid. For so long she hid from the people of her village and kept her voice down around them. But now she is running directly to them and she's shouting. She wants to let the people know about what's happened. She's shouting about the man who sat beside the well. The man who knew everything about her and did not offer judgment or condemnation, but instead offered grace and love. She's shouting because she is no longer defined by the unrighteousness or unholiness in her past, but instead she is defined by the love and grace of the man that she's just met. She's so captivated by this man that she doesn't even remember that she, leaves, she left her jar by the well. She's left the jar that represented her brokenness. It represented her noonday trek of shame. It represented the whispers of the crowd and the unrighteousness of her decisions. She left it behind because she never planned on going back to that well ever again. She had been filled with the well of living water. The well of righteousness. Friends, when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 6, that God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, we have to remember that hunger and thirst are signs of our deficiencies. And these signs, these feelings, move us to action. It moves us to search for things that are going to satisfy our souls. And so often we search for it in all the wrong places. We, we search to fill our hunger and to quench our thirst. And we go to all the wells that Jesus references in Matthew 5. We go to the well of anger. We, we say, I will, I will be angry with my neighbor. I will argue with them. I will, I will get what's rightfully mine. We, we run to the well of lust. If we could just satisfy our base desires, we run to the well of relational division, which could lead to divorce, either maritally or communally. We run to the well of revenge and to the well of loving only those who look and think like we do. Friends, every single one of those wells will never satisfy us. We hunger and long for something more. But guys, I want you to notice 
there's a man sitting by the well. And that man's, his name is Jesus, and he offers us something that will finally and truly satisfy us. Jesus is clear with this woman that some wells we go to promise satisfaction, but they never deliver it. He's clear with this woman, and he's clear with us today. Jesus said in Matthew 5 that there's only one well that will satisfy us, and that is the well of righteousness. The well of righteousness is the only one that can truly satisfy us, and this is the well from which Jesus offers us water. This woman, whose story you can read in John chapter 4, came to the well that day knowing, just as Jesus says in Matthew 5.20, that her righteousness did not exceed the Pharisees. Far from it. Well, friends, our righteousness does not exceed theirs either. But Jesus wants to give us His righteousness. And this isn't about behavior modification. It's not about doing better or, 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 or trying to change uh, on our own. No, Jesus wants to take our state of being as we are in our shame and our brokenness and our unrighteous deficiencies. And He wants to make us whole. He wants to heal us, to complete us, and to set us on a journey to tell others about Him. You see, being filled with righteousness is about transferring from one state of being to another. It's about going from being hungry to being filled. And it doesn't come from behavior, but it comes from meeting with Jesus. It's being filled with the Spirit of God and the truth about Him in all of creation. Being filled with righteousness is knowing that we've been made right with God and then living, thinking, speaking in, the, in His way every day in everything we do. It's never going back to the well that never satisfies. It's leaving the jar behind and only being satisfied with the well that comes from Jesus. So are you hungry for that kind of life? Are you thirsty for the living water of Jesus? Because the thought of consuming something that truly satisfies will in fact begin to consume us. So friends, I ask you, are you consumed with being filled with the righteousness of Jesus, the only thing that can truly satisfy us? Because if you are, this is the good news. You can be satisfied and filled today. You can be made righteous today. You can be set out on a mission to tell others about the righteousness that you have received today. You can go out and live in Oxford or wherever you find yourself as it is in heaven today. Friends, that life that is the good life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. And God, some of us are like the woman. And we've been walking in, shame, in the shame of our, our unrighteous decisions for so long. We feel that those, those are the things that have defined us. But Jesus, you offer us something different. You offer us to leave our jar behind and to take up the well of righteousness. To be filled with the Spirit of God and the truth about who He says you are. God, some of us also are like the villagers. And some of us have, been, have shamed other people. And we've yelled about other people. And we've spread rumors about other people. Well, God, today I pray that we receive the message about Your righteousness that we can actually be saved as well. Because God, every single one of us has a well that we keep going back to. And I pray that today, this very day, we stop going back to the wells that never satisfy. And we meet with the man who's sitting beside the well. The man named Jesus. 
God, we love you, and I thank you so much for your word and for your scriptures and for your spirit, which makes it come alive. I pray these things to you, our Father, in the name of Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. We've come to our time of response. And as always, you're welcome to respond in any way you see fit. If you want to pause the video and pray about the wells that you keep coming back to and the well of righteousness, I invite you to do so. You can certainly sing along uh, with the band as well, but, but I want to invite you today that if, if you need prayer, if you're like the woman and this is the first time you've met with the man named Jesus, and you want to know what it looks like to be filled with living water, to be filled with righteousness, leave a comment on this video or message our account. Our pastors want to get in contact with you. We want to pray with you. And we want to help you on your journey. And let this day be a day where you leave the jar behind and be set out on mission to tell others about the man who's changed your life. Will you respond? Oh
We now come to the time of our service for the offering. And as always, the offering is for those that consider this place their home. If you're a guest with us today, we would ask that you would not give unless you feel specifically moved to do so. But if this, but if this is your home, we would ask that this is the time where we can respond to a God has give, who has given us all things. There are four ways that you can give. You can text, you can email, you can do it online, or you can send a check in to 295 Highway 7 North. Let us pray for our offering. Let us pray for this time. Father, you have given us all things. God, in, in chief of which you have given us your son, who came to this earth, who lived a perfect life, was crucified, who was raised again, is now seated at, at your right hand. God, and upon his ascension, you gave us the Holy Spirit as counselor, as comforter, Lord, as partner with us. God, and as we respond to that, as we recognize all of the great gifts that you have given us, Lord, we offer up just a portion of what we have. Lord, because we know that every good gift comes from you. So, Lord, in response to what you have given us, Lord, we offer up our time, our talents, or our resources, however we can serve you best, Lord. And with what we have to offer, with what we can give, we would ask that you would do an amazing work far beyond anything that we could fathom or imagine. Father, may you be glorified by our giving this morning. In your name, amen. Hey church, as we go out this week, may we not return to wells of unrighteousness, but may we rather abide with our Creator, with the Jesus who loves us and cares for us, who knows us all the same and still loves us. May we abide with Him at the well where he offers living water. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.